here we are and we have a nice turnout here. Um, and I'm gonna be keeping my eye on this waiting room as more and more people join. So if I seem distracted throughout this meeting, it's probably because I'm clicking a button up somewhere that says so-and-so is coming in. Um, it's 8.05, we're just gonna wait for like maybe another minute to give the final stragglers a chance to come in. Uh, but thanks everyone so far who's here for joining. And just as a reminder, if folks could keep those mics muted during our event, in case you got any background noise, that would be super. Okay. All right, so um, welcome everyone. My name is Eric Hibbett. Um, I'm here with uh, Audrey Stone, fellow exhibiting artist at Morgan Lieben Gallery. Uh, and I'm and here with Andrew Schwartz, who's the Associate Director of Morgan Lehman. Hi, Andrew. Hi. And we're joined by Tracy McKenna, Curator Tracy McKenna. Uh, we're so happy to have you here, Tracy. Um, and let me, sorry. <laughs> Okay, let me just get a few more folks in here who are coming in. Right. All right, so I just wanna say a few words about Tracy and then I'll, I'll give the floor over to Tracy to get this shindig going. Um, Tracy McKenna is a bi-coastal independent curator with recent shows at the Flynn Gallery in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, Abel Baker Contemporary in Portland, Maine, um, Rick Wester Fine Arts in, in New York. Um, Tracy began her career in the arts uh, with position at Washington Project for the Arts in Washington, DC, Phillips Collection also in DC, and the ICA Boston. Uh, and Tracy served on the board of Franklin Street Works in Stamford, Connecticut. So, um, and I've had Tracy by my studio and I know Tracy and we, we talk sometimes and I'm so glad you could join us for this, this uh, talk. I'm so glad you could join us for Talking Color tonight. Thank you, Eric. It is really a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, in an ideal situation, we would be gathered at Morgan Lehman Gallery looking at your work and Audrey's beautiful paintings and drinking cocktails. I made a Manhattan in honor of Morgan Lehman's location and having cakes and really having a, a great in-depth conversation about color. But we're in a pandemic and we're just gonna deal with it and do the best we can. So um, we're gonna just the format for tonight, we're gonna have each artist show their work and talk about what is in the show and however they would like to introduce it. And then we'll have a conversation and go to questions at the end. So if you um, have questions, please type them into the chat and we will try and get to as many as we can. Um, please keep your microphones muted um, and we're going to start with Audrey to talk about her by fire paintings. Thank you, Tracy. I also want to just shout out to Eric for being the Zoom Meister tonight. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Yeah, hopefully I'll Meister okay. You'll be great. <laughs> it is what it is, right? Um, so, um, so I'm ready to share your images. Yeah, let's okay, just go Audrey? right ahead number one. Okay. They're, they're numbered, right? Yep, let me open those up. There we are. 
So for, um, oops, um, anyone who, this is uh, how the show looks when you enter the gallery. This is my show called By Fire and the series itself of these paintings included in the show are also titled By Fire. Um, when I talk about these, it's, it's there's a, I'm gonna give you like uh, a, little, a few shots of the gallery and then I'm gonna zero in on a few from the series and some details to show you how they're made. And I'll give you some of the backstory to how I conceived of the um, series and what kind of machinations go on in my head as I'm conceiving uh, each piece that I highlight. Um, so this series um, is called By Fire. It's um, many of you might be familiar with the song Who By Fire by Leonard Cohen. And the series is basically guided by his song. So as well as the ancient Hebrew poem called the Unatana Token, which is recited each year at the high holidays, the Jewish high holidays uh, in September or, or whenever they fall. The poem and the prayer, or, or uh, so, well, actually the song and the poem, both ask who's gonna live and who's gonna die in the year ahead and how people will die. So it's, um, I became fixated on the song, on Leonard Cohen's song, because my when my mother was ill before she died, she died in the beginning of 2019, and um, she had two fatal illnesses, and we were making a choice of how she would live out her next, the last part of her life. And then in addition to after her passing, um, I had an unusual year of loss with, with five deaths in, in of, um, significant people in my life. So I was kind of obsessed with the song um, as, as I, keep, I, I kept experiencing these losses. And in 2019, I began the series. We can go to the next one, Erin. Um, so these are two of the By Fire paintings. There are three paintings titled By Fire in the series. Um, the one on the right with the blue was the first painting in the series. So that was done in 2019. The first two paintings in the series were by fire and by water, which is the first line of the Leonard Cohen poem or song. Um, so, um, uh, and then a month after my mother died, there was a terrible fire at my father's house and everything was lost. So fire was like the meaning of the song was even driven home deeper to me, um, fire being a very dramatic event. Um, so I started thinking of working on this series and I, the first painting was the one with the blue on the right. As I was working on the painting, I realized that, you know, I was relating to the fires that were happening in California as well as Australia. And I was um, kind of like, wow, this is this, like kind of the micro part of my experience and the macro part that everybody experiences. So while there was a very personal um, connection to fire at that moment, and when I was painting it, it was it was a bigger connection as I was talking to my friends in LA and seeing you know smoke pictures on the in the cover of the paper and all that stuff. Um, we can go to the next image. So this is a section of the long wall of the gallery. There's actually seven paintings on the wall, but this is five of them. Um, each of the paintings in the series are 40 by 30 inches. Uh, most of them are in acrylic and some of them are in flash. And I always had the idea that they would be displayed um, as a group lined up, dun, 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 because that was my experience of loss in 2019. It was like, why is the phone ringing again? I can't take it, you know, it's like, what's next? Um, so, um, and while I was working on them in the studio, it was really fun to play around with how they hung and the relationships between each of them. Um, there are 18 paintings in the whole series. Uh, so I, and I thought, when am I gonna stop this series? I thought at 12 and then I realized I wasn't done. So I kept going and then I thought maybe 20 or 24 and then I realized 18 is the time to stop because in Judaism, 
18 is the number uh, that is symbolic of life. And since all of these paintings reference death, I wanted them to also reference life. Um, the titles, I'll just say briefly, a lot of the titles do refer directly to Leonard Cohen's song, like the one on the left, which is by Darkness. He does have a line for by Darkness, and the one with the yellow stripe is by Sunshine, or is who by Sunshine, uh, who in the sunshine, and, um, and then a lot of them diverge, which you'll see in the ones I'm going to show you. The, the painting with the gray um, going this and that way, that's by Stone, which is a reference to the ancient uh, poem, the Una Tanatokif, where they say, who by stoning. So while we, I was thinking, you know, we're not typically stoning each other in our culture, but actually we might as well be these days. Um, so it was kind of a, thinking a lot about the back and forth politics we were having, but also giving a wink to myself as the artist, Audrey Stone. And then it was the last painting of the whole series too. We can go on after her. Uh, this is by Sleep. Um, I wanted to show you this one because it has this kind of fluttery mark making that I developed in this series. I am a taping kind of painter. I do a lot of taping, um, but I, in the series, I started playing with different ways of creating gradient. And um, so using a, a kind of a freehand form going across the canvas to create um, a feathery or just, I don't know how to describe it, different kind of way of, of creating a line across uh, was something I chose to do in this one. So, and by sleep, I was obsessed as a child with the idea of dying in your sleep. It seemed like the idea, ideal thing. I think maybe a lot of people feel that way, but, um, and then also I love that sensation of when you're going to sleep and I feel like it's surfing, you're surfing your consciousness just before you go to sleep. And so I was trying to get at that sensation a little bit with the color. So we can move to the next one. Uh, here's a detail showing the corner. And uh, so I work from the bottom up on this one. I usually work from one edge to another bottom to top, top to bottom, side to side, or the middle out. And there's another detail next, Eric. So you can see at the top of the painting, I went back to taping. So it's a gradual um, lessening of the, ridge, of the ridgy lines into a straight line with the tape. So I, I do tape, but I leave a lot of bleed with my tape and I, I, call my, I think of my paintings as soft edge paintings. You can go to the next one. So this is by heart. It's not actually in the show, but you would see it in the office if you were at the gallery. And I wanted to show it because um, it felt very um, apropos of the moment of this week in particular. Um, there was an earlier version of this that was smaller and different colors. And when I enlarged it and made it red and blue, it really made me think of the flag, our flag. and. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, breaking hearts or um, you know, heart attacks and those kinds of things, but also just how I think a lot of us, our hearts are breaking over what's happening in our country right now. So that's part of the reason I wanted to share this one tonight. Um, if we go to the next one, you'll see a detail. So a number of the paintings have these areas that are just empty. Um, that's raw canvas with a border painted around it. And that was um, a way of, kind of expressing absence for the series. This painting also is, you know, the four chambers. I wanted it to be the four chambers, you know, parallel to the four chambers of the heart. And if the painting was facing you, it would be the chambers are offset slightly to the left, just like our bodies. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next one. This is by Breath by Air. Um, this painting came together when we learned that COVID is um, tra travels by air, and uh, when we and is communicated by sharing breath and air, and as well when George Floyd lost his life from air, loss of air was forced out of him. So 
I'm, I wanted to show these paintings because they kind of refer to things that were more contemporary at the moment and how the series developed away from the poem and the prayer and towards um, what's happening, in, was happening around me at the time. So this uh, concentric rectangular um, composition is something that I've worked with in a lot of different uh, paintings. I, I have a whole other series, the post series. Um, so it's, I have recurring sort of compositional themes and this is one of them. Um, we can go to the next is a deal of detail showing that. Um, so this one was worked from the inside to the outside edge. And uh, I wanted the inside to feel really constricted and then a kind of lifting towards the blue. And we have just one more image. And this is by six. It's also not in the show, but I wanted to show it um, as because I feel like I give myself a lot of structure in my process and in, in um, how I approach my work. These are all 40 by 30. I'm making certain kinds of compositions, but there's a lot for me, a lot of freedom within that to try different things. So, um, and to express different things and it might be more obvious or not. So this one is, um, you know, obviously the gradient is much less subtle than most of my gradients. Um, there's only three shifts. It's blue. It's blue. It's the same pink in the middle, but it's combining with the yellow at the bottom or the blue at the top. And by six refers, those bands are each six inches high, and it refers to the six people that I lost in 2019, as well as to an epidemiologist I heard in the beginning of the COVID pandemic who predicted that we would each know six people who died from this thing by the time it's over, which is unequal because obviously there's a lot of people who know a lot more people than six and there's a lot of people who know nobody who's been affected so but i thought that i was just thinking the parallel at that time of uh, myself having lost six people and then being told i might lose six more um and also i wanted to end with this one because the color is pretty hot and i know eric's color is pretty hot so i thought it'd be a good segue to some hot eric headed paintings Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. That is, um, it, I have to say that it, it is um, really heartbreaking to hear about um, the sort of layered layers of, of loss behind this particular series, um, which is, you know, visually so beautiful. Um, and as you said, a, a great segue into Eric's work. Eric, would you share um, the prism in the window? Sure. Um, and I just think it's incredible. You know, of course, Audrey, I was you know reading your your press release, and um, you know, I, I read this story in the press release, but it's it's so amazing to hear it from your from you in words. And I think it's just so incredible the way you attribute meaning and your personal experiences to abstraction. It's just so poignant and amazing. And it's a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> um, but I'll try. Um, okay. Um, Prism in the window. Um, this is my show at Morgan Lehman. Um, uh, well, I was offered the show in October, so I had been painting all year. And, um, you know, I, when it came time to pick work for the show, I, I had a lot of work, you know, all my works in my studio that were ready to hang. Um, so this year, um, I have been focused on a number of different subjects, um, including uh, plants, beach balls, flowers, and, uh, I'm in the side gallery, which is to the left when you walk in, which is a smaller space. And there's six paintings in the space. So you saw the three. And then this is a large one on the back wall. And then there are these two. Uh, one of the things that has been a development in my studio practice this year has been something that I call uh, enhanced my enhanced dots um so you can see in this painting of pills here 
um, some of the dots are kind of bigger. And then you see some kind of really tiny dots and I'll show you some detailed shots where you'll see even smaller dots. <laughs> but these uh, larger dots are made by pouring acrylic on plastic and then when they're dry, peeling them up and it, sticking them on the canvas. So they're uh, kind of a different kind of process. It's almost like a collaging with paint in a way. So another solid install shot. And we replaced what the beach ball painting with this painting, uh, which is currently up in the show called Tiger, the Yellow Tiger Lily. So this is called Beach Ball with Diver. Uh, one of the things that was key for me with this work, uh, I was so interested in transparency and how uh, the beach ball as a subject afforded me the ability to work with transparent layers. So uh, like Audrey, I use a lot of tape and, and Audrey and I had not met uh, you know, previously. So we were there at install. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. And Audrey said, oh, you use tape also. And we were talking about, I said, oh, you would do you know, this type of taping. I do this type of taping. And there was a nice taping, acry you know, taping acrylic conversation that happened. Um, and uh, anyway, that's how I get the kind of uh, you know, hard edge look in, in the work. So this is a detail shot. And I think it really kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, my paintings are definitely te textural experiences. Um, when uh, people see my work online or they see it, you know, on Instagram or something, and then they see it in real life, they say, oh my goodness, like I'm, I'm blown away. I didn't think they would be so thick and textural. And yes, um, they really are. If you ran your fingers over them, it would be kind of a bumpy kind of thing. And uh, this is like maybe like a seven by seven inch area. This painting is called Love Making. And this is a detail shot. So uh, what the, the enhanced dots, as I was referring to them before, um, these are made by uh, pouring acrylic um, paint with some medium in it and then uh, peeling those off of where I, the plastic when they're dry and sticking them together. Uh, so it's quite a lot of work to make one of these. I have to do, you know, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight pours of paint and then I kind of stick them together and then I'm kind of placing this thing on the, the painting. So the, the wonderful thing about that is that uh, well, I guess I'm kind of a control freak. You know, I'm looking continuously for ways to control my process. And um, one of the things that, that's nice about that approach is that I can pick exactly where, how to place those large dots. They can be right where I need them to be. And I get really scrutinizing about, okay, this one's over here and this one's over to the side, but it doesn't kind of touch the edge. It just comes in a little bit from the edge. And then this one's a little farther away. And, you know, those are the kind of details that like keep my process going. Uh, the dots, oh, just one more thing about the dots. Um, the dots are exciting to me because they, uh, they suit my temperament and I, I enjoy doing them, uh, but they're also a, um, Within my process, they uh, they have a lot of versatility, right? The dots can kind of be these enhanced dots and kind of have that sort of sort of presence in the composition. The dots can uh, fill an area in a certain way. They can fill an area in a different way. Down at the grass, they're in rows. Uh, they can also represent transitions between areas. Um, so there's a lot of um, different kind of roles that Mark can play, a lot of, a lot of different things that, that Mark can do depending on you know, how it's used. And then it kind of like brings the work together. Uh, this is an older work. This is from 2017 um, and Morgan Lehman was interested in it and uh, I was fine with including it because I'm open to showing uh, some transition in my work and kind of where my work, you know, how it's evolved uh, this also has thick dots in it, but it, it's harder to tell in this image. Okay. Oops. Uh, 
Okay, just checking the time. I'm going to wrap this up in just a minute. Um, this is called Dew Drops on Palms. This is a large uh, 48 by 48 inch painting of palm leaves with dew drops. Uh, this is a detail of the sun in that painting. Uh, this is a detail of one of the palm leaves. This is Prism in the Window, the, uh, is it titular? Is that the word, the titular? Um, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> titular painting of the show. And this one's called Medicine. Uh, I think this one of all of them is, is uh, my most direct response to 2020 because during this year, I kind of, uh, I really felt like art, art making was my medicine. It was very therapeutic and healing for me. And it kind of kept me, uh, it, it relieved my pain and it grounded me and it kind of did good things for me. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is my, definitely my 2020 painting. Uh, and this is the, this is a uh, yellow tiger lily. And I figured I would just, let's see if I, oh good, I can do this. So, oops, sorry. The idea here, yeah, there we go. So you can kind of zoom in and really see some of those details. Um, so this, the B is below eye level in the, the work. So I like showing it here because it can really, you can really see it. You kind of, with my work, I feel like it really requires you to pay attention. You know, there's a lot of details in it that you can miss if you're just kind of moving fast. And I know when I look at shows and galleries, I am the same thing. It's just like, you know, it's fast, 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 fast. But, um, you know, I think artists, you know, I, I have to remember with other people's work too, that I think artists do ask us to slow down and like pay attention and like, kind of sl some slow viewing is kind of nice. Um, yeah, okay, so that's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That was great. And I I'm glad that you started with the uh, mentioning um, how you and Audrey talked about taping and process because it is clearly one of the things that you have in common, both relying heavily on your process um, with very, very different effects. Um, so I wanna, because we're talking color and uh, you know, there's a whole spectrum here to talk about, um, I wanted to just have you both address um, the sense of being a colorist because I think you're both known for your um, intense use of color in different ways and that clearly you have a strong academic grounding in color theory, color wheel, etc. And how does that play out into your practices? Do you want to go first, Eric? Or you, want you, can, to you can go first, Audrey. Um, well, I have, I have a few feelings about that. Um, one is that I've, I've, I don't know if I'm answering this quite right, but my feeling about color and in, in my work is that um, color for me is, is an expression of both excitement and calm at the same time. And I, in a lot of my pieces, I'm looking for that moment where it's like visually stimulating because color is just so stimulating. And then at the same time, it brings a sense of calm at the same time, like not necessarily in the by fire series because that series has a little more intensity to it, but that is something that I've thought a lot about in my, in my work and, and tried to achieve at least. The other thing about working with color is like, I feel like there's things I know about color, like what's gonna happen if I do this blue into that red, into that whitish color. There's things that I anticipate feeling within the color um, like uh, that painting I showed of um, the sleep, the by sleep painting, like I want it to be deep, deep at the bottom, the dark color is going to go deep, the lighter color is going to come forward, there's going to be some tension and waving back and forth. Um, and then there's the surprise element. So color 
is surprising too, because I don't know everything about color. And uh, depending on what line of paint I'm using, I might not know the load of the pigment in the paint. And that could totally change the course of a painting for me where the pigment is so heavy or not heavy enough so that my gradients will be shorter or longer than I anticipate. So, or the color shift. So, I, so you're, you are in a way sort of improvising as you go, even though you've sort of planned out the specific series, things yeah. are still happening as you go. There's always room for change within a piece. And um, the color, um, I mix color as I go. So it's, it's like, you know, just literally measuring more into more into more until I get to the next color I want to be at. Hmm. There's a sort of a related question that came up in the chat from Will Hutnick about your compositions and symmetry and are those equally sort of improvisational or have you thought about those in advance before you are like, are you, um, do you keep a sketchbook? Yes, and okay. most of the pieces start with a sketch. The composition is, is pretty staged for the most part. Um, although there's little changes like that by sleep painting, there might have been more archways coming down on the side, but I got really into the, the feeling of the paint going up. So there were only a couple at the top that came down. Um, so yeah, but typically like there are changes, like I, I measure, I do a lot of measuring in my work. So if I'm off with my measurements, that can change a composition from what I anticipated, you know? And I, I, I kind of embrace the mistakes, mm -hmm. even though I might be kicking myself in the moment because that's, those are the challenges of the painting and they, and they, um, they can kind of create something new and different. Thank you. And, and Eric? What would you say about your role in terms of being a colorist and not just in your practice, but also as a professor and teacher? Uh, well, I, I love the term colorist and I, I, like, I like being called a colorist. I like to, uh, you know, when, it, when the term is apt, I like calling other people colorist because it sounds like, I mean, it's not exactly like a job, right? You can't say like, well, I'm a colorist. Um, or I want to be a colorist when I grow up, like, it's almost like a job within the job, you know, it's like, sort of like, you know, um, you're an artist, and within that, you're a really good colorist, and that, it's like almost like a specific skill set that a unique set of artists have, and um, I, um, I think I am one, and I think I think that way, and I think it has to do with, as you say, you know, a, a grounding in, you know, the, the color theory stuff, the academic stuff, but I think it's also having an intense passion for color and being able to improvise with it in a way that is like um, off the cuff, you know? And I think you knowing the kind of color theory, you know it in the, you know, you know it by the book, but then, you know, do you have the kind of, you know, uh, confidence and chops to go out there and like, I'm gonna like make a painting about orange and blue you know, and like, I'm gonna put those two things together and like make that work somehow. Um, so I think, you know, being a colorist is like, is about like, you know, having the knowledge, but also having the ability to improvise and having the passion for it. Um, and I think, so that's like the studio aspect of it. But then I also think it's about like having a good color memory. Um, I, you know, I feel like I can remember colors like, oh, like a specific pink that I remember from like a perfume bottle that like my grandmother had, or, um, you know, just details like that, you know, to get lodged in the, in the mind. And it's almost like becomes like a color vocabulary. You know, it's almost like, oh, colors are like words. Like, oh, I know that green. It's sometimes people call it army green. Sometimes people call it dark green, but it has more yellow than, you know, than either of those. And that's what that is. And having that type of like, color, um, it's like a color language, you know, a lexicon of color uh, is, is, I think, what a good colorist needs to kind of pull off a colorist's work. It's interesting that you mentioned the language um, in our, we, we prepped a little bit yesterday and I, um, I 
ask this question, and I'd love to ask it of both of you publicly, which is that in this moment where we are really in crisis in the world, we use a lot of color-based words to describe things, like things are either, you know, they're black or white, or, you know, we talk about our emotions being blue, we talk about a Green New Deal, and green is considered the environment when most of the planet is blue or brown. So could you just both talk a little, or either one of you, could you talk a little bit about language and color and how you feel about colors getting ascribed meanings? I have a- Because <laughs> colors are so laden, like, like you mentioned your grandmother's perfume bottle. Um, you know, today my daughter was trying to describe a particular dish that she wants me to make and all she could come up with was yellow and raisins. So we're still trying to figure out what she's remembering from her childhood, but you know, it clearly yeah. color sinks in. Well, I, I do have a, a thought about this and I think that, you know, like when you say like color and language, you know, like a stop sign is red, you know, that, so that's in a way, even though, um, we don't call the red color stop. The way it's used within that sign context, it, the color is a sign, right? Along with the octagon and the language that says stop. So color as a sign is very common in the world and it's it's utilitarian. You know, we use color to, to create meanings, to, under, to, to communicate, you know? But I think that um, that, you know, the way I look at color, I understand that language, of course, but I look at color aesthetically, you know, I, I get into looking at color like, oh, you know, the sky at night, tonight, it's really dark, but it's at the same time really bright. It's a dark blue and bright at the same time. That's like a color experience that, you know, it just took me a sentence to say what that color is. You can't say like, green. You know, you can't just call that sky blue. You know, it's like a certain type of quality of thing. And um, I mean, I understand the, the need to use color to communicate. And I think that's, you know, utilitarian, you know, but I, I, I see color in an aesthetic way also. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I would say there's both. Well, there's cultural color because colors mean different things, I believe, in different cultures too. Of course, so yeah. That's um, one thing. And then um, I don't know, this question also brought up vision in a way. Do we all see color the same way? I don't know. You know, we don't all experience it the same way. So I think I think there are signals. I, I have used color as a signal in a painting, you know, like an orange or a yellow is a danger sign. A feel, a, for me, at least, as a danger sign, sign but I... Um, uh, I go back to that thing about like the feeling about color, like how it makes you feel. And I, know, I can't say what my colors would feel like to Eric, you know, and Eric, because Eric has different memories and associations. I don't know. Well, they make me feel interested in your work and they make me feel... It, well, your color, well, I think you have very sensual color, you know, and I think that the sensuality is in uh, the nuance and, and the sense of space. Um, it's kind of an immersive uh, color experience because you see a, a gradient, you know, you see kind of, it's, it's almost a little bit reminiscent of like a landscape or an atmosphere. You know, and I feel like that's a very sensual thing because it gets into color temperature with your work. You kind of feel like, oh, it's a hot, it's a hot thing, you know, and it's kind of like a, um, a hot, warm experience. You know, I, I think that it's, I mean, that's how your color, that's how I, I experience your paintings. Thanks, I love that. And mm -hmm. I experience yours as like adventure and play. You know, like I feel like there's so much adventure and playfulness in the way that you approach your work, your color and your technique. And it's always surprising like that, that um, the transparency, the, the beach ball painting. Like I just kept going up real close to that painting. How did you do that? You know, and I'm always wondering, you know, 
you're like a trickster, you know? And also I was interested in how you seem to like go at color and each, there's so much abstraction within your paintings, yet they're representational, you know? And when you get up close, they're, they're all the little details. It's like, there's all these little abstractions making up a, an image that we might recognize. Very cool. It's, it's really astute and, it, and it extremely up to the point. Um, and there's actually a question from Lauren Weirdy asking Eric about the fast, slow contrast. Um, and it sort of ties into not just your slow viewing, but also the importance of seeing paintings and all artwork in person. Because if you're only looking at the work, um, you know, in the square of Instagram or on a website, it's very easy to think that all of Audrey's lines are absolutely pristine when in reality, as she says, she bleeds and there's, you know, there are, there are irregular lines. You don't pick up all of the nuances and um, uh, textural layers in Eric's work. So Eric, could you talk a little bit about the, the whole slow viewing? Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't want to like sit here and say like everyone should like, you know, you know, grind to a halt and like, you know, because I don't think that's realistic. You know, I think we're, we're rapid fire, you know, viewers, we're just used to seeing things happen fast. But I think my work, I think, is a, um, a call for a slowing down of that. Um, and I think, I think making something that's immersive, you know, I'm, I, I love Joseph Cornell, even though my work doesn't really resemble his stylistically. I'm a big fan of, of his work. And I think it's because, you know, those boxes are so immersive. You just, you, you go into them, you're entering a space. It's not like something where you're stepping back from, you know, you're kind of like going in. So, you know, with my work, even though it's, it's not a diorama, I still, you know, find ways to create dimension with contrasting textures or, you know, creating some sense of space or depth or overlapping is big, you know, I do a lot of that, um, that will kind of draw a viewer in and kind of slow them down a little bit. You know, so if they want to spend as much time, you know, and, and, you know, really get into it, that's super. I mean, there's a lot there that the, the B is there waiting for you guys to go check them out. And like, you know, that's a detail that you can really relish. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, you know, all, all you can do is make the work, right? I mean, you don't really have control over the way people view it. But um, I mean, the goal is to put something out there that people can get you know, immersed into. As I and and I'm immersed in it. I mean, as as an artist, I mean, I'm I like, you know, uh, I spent a day on the bee. You know, so it's like that's a whole day of my life that I was with that and making that, and that's a lot of time. So that is a lot of time for a bee. Well, maybe it wasn't the whole day. I know. Maybe I'm exaggerating. <laughs> Well, you know, but, but, you know, it's not just slow viewing. Sometimes it is also the slow making and the, the value of labor and mark making as a sense of, of uh, an acknowledgement of time that has gone into the work. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I really get into details in like, um, like in, um, like Persian miniatures, for example, you know, mm -hmm. that stuff is like just so exquisite and kind of mind boggling when you think about the details. But then I also love, you know, ink, you know, like uh, traditions of like Asian ink painting, you know, where it's like something very fast that happens. So, um, you know, just speak to that question about fast, slow, you know, in some of my work, I use, you know, brushworks or the kind of marks that kind of resonate a little bit differently than, you know, more detailed areas. And yeah, I like to kind of, you know, just get, make some uh, contrast with the pace, you know, can kind of keep the painting engaging. Okay, thank you. Um, we had uh, actually a really great question from 
Caitlin Booth asking about value, uh, light and dark, and how that factors into how you work with color. And Audrey, I think this is a great question for you. And you could also piggyback an answer to Eric Johnson, who wants to know if there's an origin story to your use of gradients. Um, yeah, I could probably answer those together. Like um, the origin story to the gradients is, um, and Eric, you know, you know, you you and I go way back, so you know the work that I was doing before. That I think the um, the stone drawings, and at, um, I used to do these drawings that were combining thread and ink or pencil, and it was a huge series of ninety or hundred drawings, and they spanned five years. And by the end of the working on that series, color had become predominant in my like the most exciting part. And I think I think actually a lot of my process has been like kind of shedding, shedding the things that are less important and getting to the to the color, which has become the most important thing in my work, I think, in, in some ways. Um, and then when I started doing um, paintings, I was really bopping around with color a lot, like just doing tonal kind of things and, and different um, different kinds of, you know, comparing colors. And eventually I started combining the paints more and mixing and mixing and mixing. And, and I, I started getting more into the subtlety of those transitions of color. Um, and I think that has to do with the tonal question too. Of like how, how does like the tone shifts throughout those gradients as well. Um, so what was Caitlin's question again? I'm sorry. Caitlin um, is asking about the your choice of value and light and dark and how that factors into how you work with color. Right. Yeah, because I, I when I conceive of a idea of a, a composition, I'm, it's usually very basic. Like I know it's going to be dark in a certain section and getting to light, and I'm always looking for some sort of transition from dark to light. Or, or um, so, and it might be, and that's where things can change because things do change. But, um, but I, I do think about that all the time. And, and if you look at my sketchbooks, it'll say, you know, dark with arrows here in the linear part of this part of the drawing with an arrow up there, lighter over there, dark here. That's, so that's the way that that comes about for me, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, let me ask, since we have been answering people's questions as we go along, if you have questions for each other. I did have a question. Well, I might, I, it was along the lines of that abstraction versus representation in your work, Eric. And um, um, and how does, I'm just so interested in how you conceive of your images, like, because they, like, there's, they feel very, uh, like, each part is so unique and complete, you mm -hmm. know, and then it comes into a bigger focus of the full image. So when, when you're conceiving your ideas, like how does abstract, does abstraction come into your concept? Or yeah, well, I love shape. I'm very interested in shape. You know, shape gets me going. Like, I'm like, oh, I love the roundness of this or the, you know, the, the squareness of this or how this is like a cube or this is like a whatever, you know, I, I get into that and that, that kind of um, interests me. You know, it might be like, I'm interested in this certain flower because of its kind of symmetry or something or its roundness. So that'll like home, you know, draw me into a subject. And sometimes it's, it's, I get into a subject because I know that I'm going to work with color with a specific way in doing that subject with this, which is very exciting for me. And um, so, yeah, I do think about those like, you know, more abstract visual elements about subject matter and that definitely gets me going. But then it's also like the story about the image that excites me. Like, oh, it's a, it's a flower in a garden and there's like a trellis behind it. And, oh, I could do vines going up the trellis and oh, maybe there'll be like flowers on the side too. And it kind of like, how to like fill out the picture. And um, 
you know, I um so it's not premeditated. It's not like you have a sketch that says Yeah, I have a I have a sketch of like that I, I know what I'm gonna do. And um it's a very like for me, it's a very up beat experience like the idea of thinking about what to make it's like it makes my mood go up mm -hmm. so when the mood goes up then it's like i can put this here and this here i can do this i can do this i can do this too oh my god i can do all this stuff so it's kind of like it's that's the way it plays out and i think that's the result is is from that thought mm -hmm. process you know yeah. that's great. great and so andrew i think we're just about out of time, if you want to talk a little bit about the show and the hours, and if there's any other questions, people can come up to the chat. Absolutely. Um, well, first and foremost, um, thank you, Tracy, for moderating this, and um, to our artists, Audrey Stone and Eric Hibbett. Um, we're, we've been super excited about the shows, and obviously, given the circumstances, um, it's, it's difficult to you know, put on an opening or have a real life panel. And so we hope that this would suffice and uh, that, and so thank you all for attending, of course. And um, yeah, we'd love, uh, you know, visitors are welcome in the space. We're open Thursday through Saturday, 11 to six and, uh, and by appointment. And um, the shows are gonna be up through the 23rd of, of January. So you have a, a little more time to see them. And um, yeah, hope to see you. Thanks. Thank Great. you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. So much for coming. And everyone should go and 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 go have yourself a colorful cocktail. I just finished my Bloody Mary with a pickle and now I'm gonna go eat my pickle. I've been a pickle the whole time. Save the best part for, la for later. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I look forward to the day that we can uh, gather in person and pick back up with more talk about color and your process because it's just, it's really nice to do this um, and see everyone's faces, but it is not quite the same as gathering in person. So um, thank you for putting this together. It's really delightful to um, participate and see so many friendly faces up there. It's really exciting. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for all those nice chats I'm seeing. I don't know if anyone else sees them because I'm the host, but everyone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're up on the side. Cool. Yeah, no, I love that. That's cool. Okay, good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>